it is a great pleasure today to speak about a very hot issue. Uh, this is in medicine and in COVID era. To BBI or not to BBI, to use or to prescribe proton pump inhibitors or not to prescribe them in the era of COVID-19. This, this will be the talk. I'm going to start with this. This is the pro. It is not using proton pump inhibitors just to, to suppress the acidity, but here, this is a hypothesis. Uh, using proton pump inhibitors to prevent or to treat COVID coronavirus. This is very exciting. The assumption is inhibition of sodium hydrogen, uh, hydrogen potassium base in gastric parietal cell by using proton pump inhibitors, as well as suppression of the same bump in lysosomal membranes will cause an increase in endolysosomal pH. And if you remember, the action of hydroxychloroquine or chloroquine is by this same pathway. Secondly, proton pump inhibitors were reported to uh, lead to immune modulation. So does this uh, uh, decrease the risk of cytokine storm in COVID patients? As you see, this is the medical hypothesis. So it is the pro. Let us go to the cones side. This is uh, the nationwide cohort study from Korea, including large number of patients, as you see here, more than 100,000 patients. This is the total number of the cohort, 132,000. And this is regarding the status of proton bomb inhibitors. Non-users, this is the majority. Current users, 14,000. And past users of proton bomb inhibitors, 6,000. Then, the key results. This is a very long article, but this is just a snapshot from this article. The first, the first piece here, if you look here, there is no significant difference in either in the uh, odds or in the confidence interval. This means that if we associate and link positivity of COVID-19 among this cohort with the use of S inhibitors, uh, sorry, proton bump inhibitors, the use of proton bump inhibitors was not associated with increased uh, susceptibility for COVID-19. But look at the composite endpoints, like the severity of the disease and the need of ventilator and dialysis, as you see in bold color, even using proton bomb inhibitor for short period of time increases this risk. So what are the new findings from this study? The, this cohort study uh, documented that proton bomb inhibitor use including current and past use, didn't increase susceptibility to SARS-CoV-2 infection in Korean nationwide cohort. Okay. Current use of proton bomb inhibitors was associated with worse outcome of COVID-19. So it is not good for COVID-19. The short-term use uh, for less than one month of this group of drugs, proton bomb inhibitors, conferred a significant increased risk of bad clinical outcomes of COVID-19, to put in mind. And the clinicians, and this is a conclusion of this article, clinicians should be aware of the increased risks of these agents in patients with COVID-19. And we should be wise in assessing the risk benefit so uh, we shouldn't prescribe this class of drugs except if there is severe and urgent indication for their use. This is the smallest study because this is a letter to the editor, including a uh, few patients. Sample size is very small, but to the same uh, trend. Treatment with proton pump inhibitors increases the risk of secondary infection and acute respiratory distress syndrome 
in hospitalized patients with COVID-19. So we shouldn't underestimate the risk. And the data, as you see, this is the sample size, small sample size. And I know Professor Saeed Khamis is the moderator of this session, and he will discuss uh, the, uh, the limitations. Yes, it is a limitation, but we don't have a plethora of data documenting safety of this drug uh, to be used. If you look at secondary infection and acute respiratory distress development and index of mortality, if you just compare non-proton bulb inhibitor intake versus intake, here secondary infection is uh, uh, in non-intake is 20%, here 48% doubled. And uh, are this 12, 27 more than doubled and the p-value is significant. Mortality from 5.6 increased to 19%, tripled. So again, this is the, as you know from my previous presentation, I don't like the abuse of this drug, this class. Why? Because I am convincing by the summary, or as shown in this in practice article in the American Journal of Kidney Disease, these are the adverse events associated with proton bomb inhibitor use non-kidney and adverse kidney outcome and mortality. Non-kidney events, atrophic gastritis, vitamin B12 malabsorption, cardiovascular disease, cholesterol difficile infection, community acquired pneumonia, dementia, gastric cancer, and osteoporotic fractures. All these are non-kidney side effects. Regarding kidney, hypomagnesemia, this we should be careful because electrolyte disturbance is important. AKI, acute interstitial nephritis, increased CKD and the CKD progression in renal failure. Mortality, and this is the solid outcome, increasing all cause mortality, death due to cardiovascular, death due to chronic kidney disease, and death due to upper gastrointestinal cancer. All these types of uh, causes related mortality increased with the use of proton bump inhibitors. So to be or not to be, to use them or not, I think this is a very wise algorithm. If the indication is not there, it's better to stop proton bump inhibitors. Or if there is uh, uh, symptoms, even we can think of lowering the dose in some cases. So either to stop or at least to lower the dose. So stop, stop, even if the patient has peptic ulcer and it treated for sufficient period of time, please don't prolong the use of proton bump inhibitors. If there is severe esophagitis, Barrett's esophagus, history of bleeding, gastrointestinal ulcers, chronic NSAID abuse with bleeding risk, all these, in all these situations, we can assess the patient and consult the gastroenterologist and we can continue the least possible dose. So in general, I am preferring to use them when they are uh, critically indicated, but for short period of time, and then to be either stopped or lower doses in general. But in COVID-19 uh, affected patients, as you see from Korean cohort and the letter to the editor, the observational data in human are not encouraging to use them and not to use them according to this data until we have other data. The hypothesis is, is fine because it's it changing the pH in endolysosomal and immune modulations are fine from the mechanistic point of view. But don't forget that this may be associated with increased secondary infection. And uh, the, uh, as you know, COVID-19 can find its way through the stomach and the colonization. So uh, we need larger studies. Until larger studies are available, my recommendations and my, uh, co uh, the, my opinion is to limit the use of this class to urgent indication. I, I should stop here. Thank you very much for your good listening. And I'm now ready for Professor Saeed Khamis comments.
So uh, this is the, the, the provider should limit the dose, as I mentioned, uh, the prescription. Thank you very much. Professor Sai. Thank you, Professor Hussain, for this elegant, uh, albeit short talk, but it is very uh, short and to the point, actually. Uh, so your your recommendation is as usual. You you do you don't like to prescribe. You you, you favor keep prescribing when it's indicated as usual. But if, here, if if the indication is not a strong, yeah, there is no need to add them because I can enumerate at least thirty or forty complications to this drug, class of drug. In yes. transplantation, they increase risk of fracture. In transplantation, they interplay badly with immune suppressive drugs. And even with uh, mycophenolate, you will find uh, uh, problems with the drug interactions. So um, in, in uh, increasing infection, community acquired pneumonia, ventilator associated pneumonia, small bowel uh, bacterial overgrowth syndrome, uh, Clostridium difficile, even as you know in the cardiology, they increase the risk of cardiovascular diseases, and you know well the interactions was with clobidogrel because they inhibit the metabolism of clobidogrel. By inhibition of the metabolism of clobidogrel, and you know it is a broad drug to be active as antiplatelet should be metabolized. So there is, even if it is theoretical risk, it, there is a risk. So why to prescribe them? It's better to prescribe them for a short period of time for patients with peptic ulcer or with pa for patients with a uh, severe risk of gas or side bleeding. So they are magic drugs, magic bullets for their indications, but the problem is uh, with the prolonged and the abuse of this class of drugs. And I think patients with gastrinoma may need them for uh, all over the life, so long as uh, no surgery, no different treatment. But other than this, I don't know an indication to use them forever. Yes, sir. Uh, if, as you know, that the majority of our patients is uh, dialysis patient uh, as a progesterone. Yes. Uh, so unfortunately, I have no solid data. But if you make a survey, I think you will find more sim than 60, 70 percent of our patients by inertia they use these proton pump blocker or inhibitors. Uh, like chocolates, like a bomboni. Uh, I don't know. It is our mistake as a physician. It is their, their mistake as a patient. I don't know. I need your comment on this point. Uh, thank you very much, Professor Said, for this elegant point. There is a very nice study, observational study, done in dialysis patients, showed that abusing proton bomb inhibitor was associated with increased risk of mortality. Uh, uh, this may be uh, due to magnesium disorders, maybe QT interval, whatever, increasing fractures, uh, whatever the, the association, but there is increased risk. So my point of view, it is better not to abuse them. Uh, sometimes the patient, uh, like placebo, if you say to the patient, this is a magic drug, and you reduce your symptoms, and the patient reads the cost of the drug because this, these are costly medication, they are expensive. And you want to uh, stop them, the patient will say, you are preventing the patient from these drugs because they are expensive. So you are not on uh, his side. This is a quite problem. So uh, this is the, I think it is mistake from doctors to abuse these drugs, but if the patient status and there is severe symptoms are like severe reflux osteophagitis, and you are convinced by their rule, please use the lowest dose as possible. We can use alternate day or one week and uh, an alternate week, or using them intermittent with each two receptor blockers. So this, all these are strategies for deep prescription. Uh, so uh, this is why I am fixing the last point in the presentation is to ward the deep prescription. So to be or not to be, not to be, except if there is extreme indication. Yes, sir. Actually, the, we got the message and I hope that the people who, uh, our colleague who will uh, see the video, video yes. will get the message also. Uh, try to prescribe as short as you can, I mean the time. 
Okay. Okay. Thanks, Professor. And uh, I hope that uh, uh, all uh, who will listen to this video will find it attractive and uh, carry uh, in a message. Thank you very much and goodbye. Inshallah. Goodbye. Salamat.